Welcome to Bethel Christian Assembly from Lakewood, Colorado. Thanks for joining us today. We hope this message blesses you. Today, Pastor Gary teaches from the book of Hebrews as he encourages us with a message of hope. Let's join in now. Well, this time last week, where were you? I think, Debbie, you guys are watching the wildlife up at the cabin, right? Yeah. I enjoy your pictures that you post. I don't always get the opportunity to comment on them, but I never, I'm never disappointed with God's creation. It's a blessing. Isn't it always amazing? It so softened my heart that I find it difficult to go hunting anymore. <laughs> um, but yet at the same point in time, I guess I'll just have to rise to the challenge. <laughs> Where were you last week? I know where I was about this time. I was pulling up to Sweet Baby Jesus Ranch. And um, well, why did I go over there last Sunday? First, before I go any further, I just want to thank Dan and Jill for stepping in and filling in when we're gone. Um, I'm so blessed in that sense. I know their heart. I know their heartbeat. And um, I have uh, total confidence that when I'm gone, Things will get done in a biblical way. Amen? Amen. So I was pulling up Sweet Baby Jesus Ranch. I was thinking about you all. And uh, the reason I went over there was because you all, all you all, right? <laughs> all you all. <laughs> that means everyone. <laughs> I think that's according to Phil. Uh, the Duck Dynasty or whatever it is. It's all ye all. <laughs> um, and so I was thinking about all ye all in that sense, and I was having the difficult task of loading up the track skid steer, heavy piece of, uh, heavy, uh, a piece of heavy equipment. And I've never, ever pulled anything that heavy. And so I had my, um, not doubts, but I had my concerns, let me put it that way. And I wanted to make sure that we were able to load the trailer correctly, uh, that we were able to secure the load correctly, and that we were able to transport the um, track skid steer over to the cabin over in South Park, over in Jefferson, without any issues. And um, I'm here. The tracks get steers at the cabin in Jefferson, and so that's the testimony or the corresponding evidence that everything was done correctly. Um, the tracks get steer weighs about 10,000 pounds, and you put it that on a, on a trailer, a dual axle trailer that's um, equipped to carry up to 14,000 pounds minus its own weight. We're right at the maximum weight. And uh, I was all by myself. I had to back the truck up about 20,000 times, it seems. And I did my little back and forth, 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 until I didn't have to do any more back and forths. And, and, I, was, uh, and I was able to get it to set down correctly. And then I pulled the skid steer up on top. And I'd watched a, a couple of little YouTube videos showing that, you know, if you're loading something that heavy, you should never put your vehicle in park because if you it could actually ruin your transmission. So I put sticks or limbs underneath the rear tires and, and um, I left it in uh, neutral and uh, drove the skid steer up on the, on the trailer. And about that time, my neighbor, Dave Perkins, came down and, and I asked him and he, he's uh, uh, our neighbor to the north of us, which owns uh, Kaiser Creek Cabins and a good godly man. And uh, we've made really good friends with him over the summer. And we talked about the load and everything. And uh, he says, uh, well, you, you want to spend the night up the cabin? I got a cabin for you. And I says, no, that's OK. I've got my sleeping bag. And I'm going to try it out and all that stuff. And anyway, I was able to get everything loaded. I loaded it, pulling it up. And then I said, no, I think I'll take it off and turn it around and get more weight on the front tires. And, of the trailer and so forth, and I'm glad I did because there was no swaying at all. And I had chains, and those chains are heavy. 
Um, but we got it done. Praise God. Amen. Um, I was going to stay over there Sunday night and come back to the cabin on Monday, but I was already loaded and ready to go around 1 o'clock, so I decided to make it a very long day, and I drove, actually I had left here at 4 o'clock or 4.30 on Sunday morning, and I was able to get to the cabin around 7 o'clock Sunday evening. So I drove four and a half hours, loaded the skid steer, ate a little bit, and uh, then headed back to the cabin another four and a half hours. And so we had great weather, um, and um, yeah, it's at the cabin now for the winter. Um, and then I brought the trailer down here because I had to make another trip up there to get the UTV. And we'll be doing that within the next couple of weeks. Before the weather, I hope, turn, uh, before the weather turns bad, I hope. Um, this, is, this has been an amazing week. Um, of course, we had the presidential election, and it would seem that we're changing presidents. But that won't help. What we need, according to the song, is a change of heart. Amen? We need a change of heart. I'm trusting, even though... Um, there's, there's emotion, passion on each side, and that's what you would expect in a presidential election. But I'm trusting that the allegations of voter fraud is not true. Did you hear me? I'm trusting that it's not true. Okay, it doesn't matter whether I like Trump or Biden. What I'm trusting is that the parties didn't cheat. Because if for whatever reason they did, all hell will break loose. And we don't need chaos, do we? What we need is unity. But unfortunately, just as a change of address from the river to the church doesn't change a person, the way in which we experience unity is to have a change of heart. Amen? And that's what America needs, a change of heart. Uh, so I'm praying that um, things will settle down, that these allegations are false. And like I said, if they're not false, then I think we've entered into a realm in which is um, very unpredictable and very scary. However, I pray that God's will always be done. I was speaking with a person on Facebook, and I says, I'm going to remain biblical in that I know God can use unrighteous individuals to bring about his purpose. Now, that's a pretty unique statement, isn't it? But if you think about it, we're all unrighteous. And you're no more unrighteous or less unrighteous than I am. Now, I know that as human beings, we take and look at the fruit of unrighteousness instead of the act that causes unrighteousness. But as Christians, we need to focus on the choice that brings unrighteous acts or the choice that brings righteous acts. That's what God looks on. And so, according to the Bible, there are none righteous. And if, in fact, we have righteousness, our righteousness is as filthy rags. And so God, in his infinite wisdom, is able to work through unrighteous individuals to accomplish his will. Isn't that amazing? And so just as he worked through Trump to accomplish his will, he will work through whomever, Mr. Biden and Ms. Harris, through them to accomplish his will. And his will is more than four years. We don't elect God every four years. <laughs> he has, a, isn't that amazing? Do you ever think about that? Oh, we're going to vote for God this year. <laughs> I'm out campaign, campaigning for God. <laughs> oh. Can I hear a G? Can I hear an O? Can I hear a D? <laughs> All right. God. No. 
But in some senses, we are here to campaign for God, are we not? As children of God, and a child of God is simply defined by an individual who has a relationship with God, the uncaused cause, through his son, Jesus Christ, and is allowing the Holy Spirit to make the choices for them when choices are necessary to be made. And in doing that, our behavior then speaks to the very aspect of our faith, the fact that we have placed our faith in the Creator instead of our faith in the created. And when we think about all that and we move into Hebrews and we look at long ago, God spoke to the fathers by the prophets at different times and in different ways. In these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. We've discussed the fact that God outside of time and history has stepped into time and history as the incarnate word in human flesh, namely Jesus Christ. Jesus at that point in time, the Christ after he was obedient even unto death. All right. Christ the Messiah. All right. What's amazing is that the Gentiles weren't looking for a Messiah. Who, were look, who, who was looking for a Messiah? The Jews. The Gentiles had their gods, G-O-D-S, little g, because their gods were fictitious, fictitious, raised up, created matter of some sort or another that they would bow down and worship to, similar to the golden calf that was made by the Israelites as Moses was coming off the mount with the Ten Commandments. That golden calf was inanimate, had no significance except in the minds and the psychological aspects of the minds of the individuals who made it. It brought chaos. And so God, who has to be outside of time and history because he brought time and history into, into its existence by creating time, space, and matter all at the same time, and we're part of his creation. God then chose to reveal himself through the prophets in the Old Testament. And in these first few verses, what we talk about is actually the, the author brings up, and we haven't brought this aspect out yet, but I wanna do that this morning, is the superiority of Jesus, the prophet, versus the prophets of the Old Testament. The superiority of the prophet Jesus versus the prophets of the Old Testament. Jesus is incomparably, is a comparably better prophet than all that went before him, all the prophets that preceded him or preceded him. That is, to all the previous prophets, Jesus is superior, all right? Now, why is he superior? First of all, he's God incarnate in man. God actually stepping into history. In the Old Testament, God stepped into history by speaking through individuals and even by speaking through things. God rebuilt himself to the Israelites, God chose to reveal himself in a special way. Now we've talked about the fact that God, you can know that somebody greater than you exists by just looking at nature. We've discussed that. If you look around and you, you have this self-awareness that you exist separate from this pulpit or from this Bible for that material, that you have existence and that your existence is not an illusion but you actually exist, we've talked about that you can, comp that you can think about this fact that somebody greater than you exists. 
Actually, you only have two choices. Somebody greater than you exists or this that we see came from nothing. And even science, we always hear, well, we should follow the science, right? We should follow, and we know science is right, uh, even though, and, and I'm not here to be a critic of all the people about COVID-19, but there's more people wearing these masks today than ever has been wearing them. Do you wear your mask a lot? Every place you go? How many people don't wear their masks? Hmm? How many people defy the governor's requirement that when you step into a restaurant, you don't have a mask on? That being the case, those of us that are wearing masks, it would seem that the case number of COVID-19 would go down instead of up. If, in fact, these were having a great effect. Now, I, I, I'm not a scientist. I don't know if they have an effect or not. I know one thing, that I've been wearing a mask all my life. You just haven't been able to see it. The psychological mask that I'm the creator, instead of just part of his creation. Instead, one day, I woke up and became logical, and it came out of my delusion that I'm part of God's creation and he's the creator. So I went back to the truth. And the way I can know the truth is, number one, I can know that somebody greater than me exists by just looking around. That's logical. The greatest question of philosophy is simply not why there's something, or not, is, is why, is actually that. The question is, why is there something when there should be nothing? Well, that's because God chose to create. And we can know that because he's chosen to reveal himself through prophets. That's the special revelation. God has chosen to reveal himself to us in time and history through select individuals. Not because they were righteous, not because they were better than us, but because he had to reveal himself somehow through somebody. So he chose those individuals. And when it talks about long ago, God spoke to the fathers by the prophets at different times and in different ways, it's referring to the fact that God sent appointed messengers, prophets, throughout Israel's history to warn and guide his chosen people. But in these last days, the writer of Hebrews is saying, that in the last days of this present period of time, and I'll get to that in just maybe this morning, hopefully. Well, let me just say it this way. The, the Hebrews believed in the present time and the coming time, and in between the present time and the coming time was the day of our Lord period. It was a transitional period of time. Let me just kind of parallel that with what we've said in the past. It's created, is emblematic of the present time. It's done, is emblematic of the coming time. And the day of our Lord is emblematic of it's finished. So the phrase, it's created, started the present age. The statement by Jesus hanging on the cross stating, it's finished, began the day of the Lord. The transition period between the present time and the coming time. And the coming time is emblematic by the phrase, it's done. And so today we live in the day of the Lord. We're living in this period of transition be, between the present time, and that's in the last days of the present time, Jesus came. 
But the present time has now been concluded because of his coming, his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension. And we're living today in the day of the Lord. And one of these days, the day of the Lord, that period of grace will disappear and will move from the world as we now know it to a new heaven and a new earth. And God will say it's done. That is his whole purpose his whole purpose for creating will be completed. It will be completed in this sense that even the unrighteous has been reconciled to a holy God. Not in the sense that they personally accept the holy God, but the very fact that the unrighteous will have been given the desire of their heart and separation from a holy God. Because in love, God allows people to have the opportunity to choose. And if your choice is not to be with God for eternity, that's your choice and God doesn't like it, but God respects it. And God will give you the desire of your heart in that sense. But the desire of your heart in that sense can't happen until the second resurrection. Well, in the first resurrection, those that desire to be with God, the dead in Christ will rise first, and then those who are alive will be caught up with them and into the heavens, and we'll go with Jesus for a seven-year period of time. And then we will come back to rule and reign with Jesus as the king of kings on earth for 1,000 years. And then after that thousand years will be the second resurrection. Now, first of all, those that have a desire, those that have a desire, those that have a desire to be with God will have that desire fulfilled in its totality, in its completeness, when they become like Christ in the first resurrection. You know, I don't, I don't know about you. Oh, yes, I do. You have the same desire that I have that we become like Christ, amen? amen? Now spiritually, the kingdom of God is at hand. All right? Spiritually, the kingdom of God is at hand. Isn't that right, Seth? What's at hand? The kingdom of God, amen? Focus, please. Focus. So, spiritually speaking, we can be like Christ now. We can be obedient to God the Father. And as we're obedient to God the Father, the corresponding evidence of that is our behavior that becomes moral like the morality of Christ. We become like Him. Now, if I ever have a desire the best desire that one can have, let me put it that way, is to become like Christ, amen? To become like Christ. He's my hero. He's my example. He's my king. He's the greatest prophet, the superior prophet. He's the complete, total revelation of God who lives outside of history in history in time and history. There are no more prophets to come. There are no more revelations to come. God has revealed his entire will for humanity through his son, Christ Jesus. Even though his revelations were partial to the prophets of old, they are not partial, but they're totally complete in his prophet, Jesus, in his son, Jesus, in his king, Jesus. That's hard. It's, it's, it's sometimes hard to comprehend how God can exist outside of time and history, but we can because he's given us this analogy of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And we can understand that. Can we not? 
The son wants to be like the father. And the father wants the son to be like him. Amen? I know when I was growing up, I wanted to please my father. Was that your desire too? To please your father? And you wanted your father to love you. And if in fact you had a moral father and you were being obedient to your father who was being biblical in their parenting to you, you would in your obedience receive the love of your father. Now it doesn't always work that way unfortunately. Because as human beings, we have potential. But God has no potential. He's actual. And so it works perfect in that analogy, but not always the analogy of actual human beings in time and history. Sometimes we don't have biblical parents. Sometimes those individuals are immoral in their behavior towards their children. Sometimes they demand respect instead of earn respect. That's unfortunate. And it brings chaos to that family. It brings chaos to those individuals, to that child and to that parent. Maybe you're a byproduct of that chaotic parenting and family. And if you are... God has a healing for you. Amen. God has a healing for you. So in these last days, he spoke to us through his son. That is, God was in the world. This is New Testament scripture. God was in the world, reconciling the world unto himself through his son, Christ Jesus. Instead of speaking through various individuals like he did in the Old Testament, he spoke through his son his exact representation and the radiance glory, the glory of radiance of his father who is outside of time and history. So the question Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the father. That is, you've seen God who exists outside of time and history. If you've seen me, you've seen the father. My father and I are one. My father and I are one. And the oneness is this, is that whatever God is outside of time and history, Jesus is inside of time and history. Does that make sense? Sure. Now, God used unrighteous individuals to prophesy or to reveal his will or to reveal his special revelation to the Israelites. But in these last times, God has used a righteous individual, his son, to reveal his complete will to humanity. Not only to the Israelites, but to humanity. The word of God says the gospel, the good news, is the power of salvation. The power unto salvation. First for whom? For the Jews. And then for the Gentiles. And if you take a look at both, what you're actually saying, the gospel, the good news, is the power unto salvation for all of humanity. For all of humanity. <coughs> and Jesus becomes the Messiah for the Gentiles. He becomes the method, the means, the way. Remember, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one cometh unto the Father except via me. Now via, I added, all right? I just shortened it up a little bit. That's Belk's version, okay? It's not the King James, it's not the NIV, it's Belk's version. No one comes unto the Father except via me. That is, I am the means by which sinful man comes back into a right relationship with God. That's what he revealed to the disciples and to the individuals with whom he associated with 
during the first century, during the 33 years that he lived. And we have the eyewitness historical accounts recorded for us by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John concerning the messenger, concerning the prophet, concerning the son, and concerning the king who is God the Son, or Jesus, the Messiah, Jesus Christ, amen? And when he said it is finished, when he hung on the cross, now, we can talk about this all day long until we're blue in the face. But how many of you choose to be like Jesus when someone has perpetrated a wrong upon you, a grievous wrong? It's not that you just ate half of my sandwich, Linda. Okay, we can overlook that. The net, she eats off of my plate. Can you imagine that? Oh my God. Don't you dare. That's mine. I have a little eight inch circle. And what I wanted, I put on that plate. It wasn't for anybody but me. And how could you take what has been reserved for me? I'm not talking about that little stuff, okay? We've come to a mutual peace on this. I just want you to know, this is not gonna cause a divorce here. Although it's come close. <laughs> You're laughing. Are you the same way? Huh? How many of you, this is my plate. Huh? Well, if it was your plate, why do we have plates? I would just have, oh, I know, we'll just eat right off the plate in which all the stuff sits. We won't separate it. You can tell this really is under my skin, can't you? Huh? <laughs> Got to get it out in the open. Let it go. Let it go. And so, over 43 years, we've learned to ask. But you know what's kind of nice is that she asks about the same time I say. She asks this question about the same time I'm saying it. May I have some? Yes, you can. So if I could say that at the same time, that's kind of the way it is now. May I have some? Yes, you can. All kind of jumbled together. It doesn't matter. But can you be like Christ when it comes to some really serious Grievous is issues that maybe somebody has perpetrated upon you or done to you. Can you look him at the eye and with purity of heart say, I forgive you. I forgive you. Even though you're wrong, I forgive you. And not only do I forgive you, but I'm going to die for you to prove that I've forgiven you. To prove it. Because we can say all day long, like I said, till we're blue in the face, I forgive you. But it's your corresponding actions after that statement that really speaks loudly. Oh, I forgive you, Pastor Gary. Yeah, then they go let the air out of my tires. Huh? No. If you say, I forgive you, then you go wash my car. I, that would be corresponding evidence to your love for me. Jesus said, I forgive you. And what did he do? He washed the feet of the disciples. Now, they wore sandals. I tried wearing sandals up at the Sweet Baby Jesus Ranch. Oh my. My feet were dirty. 
And I don't know about you, but my toenails grow fast. I tell you what. I t you know, oh my Lord. And here, my feet are dirty, and my toenails are long, and I gotta wash those things. <laughs> you know what my wife does? She'll give me a pedicure. See, it's, when you're young, you can bring that old leg right up there real close and you can do it yourself. <laughs> but when you get older, that motion, that motion seems to disappear. <laughs> you know? And I'll say, sweetie, she, before I say, sweetie, she says, you need a pedicure. <laughs> do you love me? Yes. <clears throat> love and the actions that follow the statement, I love you. And the action that follows the statement, Lord, forgive them for they know what not they've done. Speaks loud, doesn't it? I know Charlie loves me because he wants to be around me. He wants to cuddle right up next to me. Where Charlie was having a tough time, he sprained his back by jumping off the bed. We had to take him to the, to the doctor, to the veterinarian, and they gave him some pills to um, take away the inflammation and um, to take off the, the edge of the pain. And he's doing better already. And uh, that shows that we love him. If we show concern, we knew something was wrong. We just didn't know. Linda, you know what I'm talking about, because I know you're a dog lover. And you love your dogs, and you know your dogs, and they know you, and they know when something's right or wrong, and you know the same. And so, when something's not going right, you take and seek assistance in trying to help them. So in the Old Testament, what we find out is God had sent appointed messengers, prophets, throughout the entire history of the Israelites to warn and guide his people. But in these last days, and this is exactly what the Hebrew author is saying, is that God has sent his son. See, God sent prophets. They weren't his son. They were just men. And they took the message that God had given them to other men. But God had to provide that message to those men. In this sense, when God sends his son, it's actually God delivering the message in time and history, not only to the Israelites, but it to all of humanity. And that message is meant to enlighten individuals as to their relationship with God and how they can improve that relationship with God. And not only improve it, but also understand that if you choose God, you get a benefit package that has been predestined specifically for children of God. And if for whatever reason you choose not to choose God, then he enlightens those individuals to the benefit package that has been predestined specifically for the sons of disobedience. He delivers a message of hope instead of a message of doom. He delivers a message of life instead of a message of death. He delivers a message of light instead of a message of darkness. He delivers a message of unity instead of a message of chaos. He delivers a message, my friends, of love instead of a message of selfishness. In past times, God revealed his will 
to individuals we call prophets who shared that message, but it was an incomplete message. It might have been just this. You're sinning, and I want you to stop sinning. But we also know that God used the prophets to predict the coming of the Jewish Messiah, the Son of God in time and history. And God said in the fullness of time, He sent His Son. In the fullness of time. God knows that exact moment. And He wasn't a second early or a second late. He was spot on in His timing. And whereas the men of old, the prophets of the Hebrew scriptures and the last prophet, Malachi, which was about 400 years before the birth of Christ, with that one, the prophecies stopped because that which had been prophesied is beginning to happen. God was preparing... For the, re, for, the, for the birth of his only begotten son, God was preparing individuals and the society in the Hellenistic world of Greek society and that world which was at the time in which Christ was born, he was preparing them to be able to receive with great efficiency and effectiveness his son. He was not developing it so that his plan would fail, but he was developing the ambiance and the atmosphere and the environment so that we could be the beneficiaries of his redemptive work. Amen. Of his redemptive work. So God sent his messengers. In the Old Testament, there are prophets. In the New Testament, we're his messengers. We're to share the gospel, the good news, the ministry of reconciliation. The word prophet was first mentioned in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 18, verse 18 and 19, and it says this, I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their fellow Israelites, and I will put my words in their mouth. He will tell them everything I command him. I myself will call to account anyone who does not listen to my words that the prophet speaks in my name. Um, and so the prophet would speak the words of God. The prophet spoke the truth when it came from God. The prophet spoke authoritatively on behalf of God. The prophet never spoke on their own authority. The prophet never spoke by sharing their own opinions, but they only shared the message of God as God instructed them to do so. The prophet's mission and role was to make God's will known to the Israelites. They were to instruct God's people to make choices of righteousness versus choices of unrighteousness. They were to instruct God's people to reject idolatry, that is, God said have been set up from the created. And they were to instruct God's people to be obedient and not sinful or disobedient. In the Old Testament, there was a means by which the sins of the Israelites would be dealt with. And that would be on the Day of Atonement once a year. When the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies and spread the blood of the perfect lamb that was found among the created lambs. 
and ask for atonement for the sins of the people. But now, and as we will discover as we move through Hebrew, is that the perfect spotless Lamb of God has given his blood and has spread it upon the altar in the chapel, in the temple, in the holy of holies in heaven. And there is no longer a necessity to repeat that sacrifice year in and year out. And that's why God could say through his son, it is finished. The atonement of sins, the method by which sinful man can come back into right relationship with God has been completed. And all it requires of us is to have faith in his plan of salvation. You see, the sovereign God has the right to determine what will satisfy his righteous requirements. And he determined that his righteous requirements would be satisfied if you and your free will would choose to accept his plan of salvation. His plan of salvation. Unfortunately, I hear too many people saying, well, you know, pastor, I believe. not what you believe, it's what's written. And hopefully what you believe is what's written. Does that make sense? I don't know about you, but today I choose to believe what's written. I believe what the author said. Not what the commentarists say. You see, the first commentary was written by Satan. Oh, you won't die. You'll just be like God, knowing good from evil. He changed. Is that what God said? No. So the biblical prophet was to instruct God's people to reject idolatry, that is the created gods, and to, including self. Self. When we get rid of God, we set self up to be God. Now that's delusion. And it's ultimate. And to get rid of sin or disobedience. The word of God says that if I confess with my mouth, Jeremy, that Jesus Christ is Lord and God is faithful and just to forgive me of my disobedience or my sin and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Amen. Combination of several scriptures. So that once I place my faith in Jesus as being the son of God and in God's plan of salvation, I then become a child of God, and as a child of God, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Amen. I want you to know that if you've chosen God, be your free will, and you have faith in his plan of salvation, the means by which that plan is implemented, his son, then you have and are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Now Satan will attempt to take that golden nugget away from you. Don't allow him to. Stand firm on the solid rock of Jesus Christ. Stand firm on the blessed promises and the predestined benefits that you have from a sovereign God via your faith, your free will in his game plan. The divine inspiration and instruction of the Old Testament prophets was affirmed by the New Testament 
Apostle Peter. When Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20 through 21, no prophecy of scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things, for prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but prophets through human, through humans, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. As they were led by the Holy Spirit. Now, in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit would come upon a person and they would prophesy and then the Holy Spirit would leave. In the New Testament, God came in person. Jesus was fully human and fully God at the same time. Now, that blows your mind, doesn't it? But remember, all possible things with God are possible. And God was in Jesus, not just part of the time, not just some of the time, not on just Sundays and Mondays and Fridays, not the third shift, the second shift, or the first shift, not on the even hours or the odd hours. Jesus, God didn't take any time off. Can you imagine that? But God was in Jesus 100% of the time. And Jesus sought the will of God that dwelt within him. So that he would what? Always bring praise, honor, and glory to the Father. And in that sense, Louise, he was found without any disobedience. What a statement. As the prophets in the Old Testament were human beings <coughs> that were unrighteous, but yet God used them to share his special revelation in such a way that we can know that we were not in a right relationship with God. In the New Testament, God, who is in Jesus, who was not working through a vessel that was unrighteous, but through a vessel that was righteous because he remained obedient even unto death, to reveal the fact that there's a possibility to move from being unrighteous to righteousness in him. He provided all of humanity, not the penalty of sin, but the hope of resurrection to be with God for eternal life. Amen. Oh. I don't want to leave out ladies. There were prophetess in the Old Testament as well. That is, God used women to share his revelation as well. We have um, arranged the Old Testament books in such a way to talk about major prophetical books versus minor prophetical books. And it has nothing to do with the message. It has to do with the length of the book. Isn't that amazing? If it's long, then it's a major prophet. So let me just ask you a question. If I'm long-winded preaching, am I a major preacher? Huh? You ever think about it? Oh, I got a major preacher. I got a major teacher. <laughs> or if I'm short, does that mean I'm not a major preacher? I'm a minor preacher? Huh? <laughs> so, for whatever reason, we've arranged the Bible and it's done so in a manner that... Uh, that major, and the terms major and minor were given to some of the prophetic books of the Old Testament simply as a method of division. Uh, and, of course, as I've made mention, as the major prophets are described as major, not because of their material being more major in significance, but just longer in writing. 
Um, the major prophets are Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, and Daniel. The minor prophets of the Bible are shorter books with more specific content compared to the broader subject of the major prophets. And they are Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. Now, I don't know if I'm going to have any more children. Those names are going to be part of it. <laughs> and then we have the final prophet, Jesus. And as we'll learn in the book of Hebrews, the author uses the word superior. Jesus is superior to all the other prophets. Jesus is superior to all the other prophets. The other prophets were unrighteous, but God spoke to them with partial revelation. But Jesus is righteous and speaks a complete revelation through his son, Christ Jesus. And in that sense, he is superior. Jesus is the complete and final revelation of God to humanity, complete in comparison to the partial revelations given at various times and various ways with the previous prophets in message, both in message and means. In these last days, God has spoken to us by his son. The last days of the present age has expired because Jesus was born, lived, was crucified, buried, resurrected, and now is ascended. So the present age that the Jews believed in has expired. And the day of the Lord, the transition period between the present age and the coming age is taking place. And that is why Jesus said, Brother Jeremy, Jesus said, the kingdom of God is at hand. My question to you, are you living in his kingdom? Are you dwelling in the presence of the Lord? Are you listening to his voice? And are you acting like a king's kid? Hopefully you are. Live in the kingdom. Take your rightful place among the children of God as being the body of Christ and walk worthy of the calling he has given you. Let's pray. Our precious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your revelation to individuals in the Old Testament who were guided by you to share, but yet most of all, we're thankful for your Son who is the complete, total, and final revelation of you, of you who exists outside of time and history. He is the complete the final revelation of you in time and history. We're thankful that not only does he tell us where we're at, but he tells us where we can go, and he gives us opportunity to get there. Father, this morning we just are thankful that we can stand here in the presence of God and dwelt by the power of the Holy Spirit to perform your will in this dark and dying world. So today we just ask that you provide us the strength, the wisdom, the courage, the knowledge, and the ability to shine for you. In the name of Jesus Christ we pray, amen. Thank you, God bless you. Have a great week. And don't listen to the news, all right? <laughs> Thank you for joining us today. Please let us know how we can pray for you and your loved ones. You can submit your prayer request at itswritten.org, as well as find additional teachings in truth. 
If you would like to join us in person, we meet Sunday mornings at 9 a.m. For more information, our address and phone number are on our website, itswritten.org. Thanks and God bless you.